Easter uh, to each and everybody that's here. Thank you for celebrating with us today, guys. I'm so excited about all that Easter is. Like, it doesn't have the amazing songs that Christmas does, right? You don't dance around singing it's the most wonderful time of the year. But this is the most wonderful time of the year, right? Like, we don't really do winter here, right? This is, spring is more than just that couple of weeks that we have green stuff around. There's this anticipation and excitement with all that Easter has to offer. And I'm so excited that we get to celebrate that together today, this Resurrection Sunday. But also want to give a quick shout out. If you are a volunteer on one of our serve teams that has, in some capacity this weekend, either at our Good Friday Service Friday or our event yesterday, the Easter Extravaganza, or here at services this weekend, has served somewhere, would you just raise your hand? I just want to, yeah, you guys give them a round of applause. I think we should do that. I can't really clap. You guys will have to do it for me. Um, it's been a long weekend for some of us, but here's the, the beauty of the long weekend. Everything that we do is to the point of helping people find and follow Jesus. So we've gotten to announce as we had a good Friday service that was like simple and stripped down in the middle of a neighborhood with kids playing basketball. And it was like a little bit crazy. We just sat and took communion together and did some scripture readings. And I only talked for like five minutes that turned into 10 or 15, but you know how that goes. It was pretty short. And we just had this like simple focused time to celebrate that Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty of our sin in an environment that you wouldn't normally have that was just so awesome. And then yesterday we saw more than 2000 people come to this huge egg dropping helicopter experience that was sort of terrifying, to be honest. Like anytime you mix kids with helicopters, I get a little nervous, but we push ahead anyway. And man, it was so much fun. It was like controlled chaos in every sense of the word, especially the three to five year old egg drop. Those of you who were there are already like, oh my gosh, that was a moment of terror. So all of our age groups, like it was super organized. Sue, you did an amazing job just organizing the whole thing. Kids had to check in and get their colored wristband, right, that went with their age group. And they went out on the field when their age group was called. But here's the deal. We split them up into age groups so helicopter could come multiple times and drop the eggs because they could only hold so much. And also because you get that many kids on the field and it's just crazy, right? So we have this, I'm going to try to draw it for you. Here's the rectangle. This is what the field looked like, but imagine this is like a football field or bigger. The north side was our staging area where the kids would come and line up when it was their color's turn. And then they were supposed to stay on the perimeter of the yellow ropes in the staging area. And our volunteers would lift the rope when it was their time and they'd run out onto the field. Unless you're three to five, then you do whatever you want, of course, right? So there was so many three to five year olds. I kid you not, I don't know what was in the water from 2013 to 2016. <laughs> But there was a quadrillion of these kids, like more so than all the other age groups. And they're at the age too, where like parents are needing to go with them because it's a little chaotic in there. So there's not just like the whole staging area up here is packed, but they're lining the perimeters of the entire field as well. They're just everywhere coming out of the woodwork. And the helicopter comes and I'm on the phone with Brandon, our associate pastor. He's got to give a signal so the helicopter knows to come. So I give him the signal that it's clear. There's nobody on the field. The helicopter has four bags of Easter eggs to drop. I know because I counted them all. And so he went and dropped the first bag of Easter eggs and the kids are supposed to wait until the helicopter leaves after dropping all the eggs and then we'll count down and they go. That first bag hit the ground and you know there was one kid, right? That one kid just sets the whole tone that was like, those are mine. And he just ran out on the field and then everyone followed him. Like all the kids chased out too. And so our volunteers were like, stop, don't. There's a helicopter that will literally kill you on the field. You cannot be there. And I was on the microphone that didn't work because there's a helicopter right there. I don't know what I was thinking. Like shouting, no, come back. You have to wait. So the helicopter had to leave because it was dangerous. And so he flew away without dropping all the eggs and did a big circle. And we had to try to rush all the kids off the field. And once they were on the perimeter, we finally got to bring the helicopter back, drop the rest of the eggs for the three to five-year-olds. Then after the helicopter was safe distance away, believe me, I waited longer than I should have. And I was like, all right, you guys ready? Five, four, three, two, one, go. And we lifted the rope and the kids just flooded the field. And it was mayhem and joy and excitement. And they scooped up their eggs. But in the chaos, there were so many kids on the field. For that age group afterwards, I had five different kids or parents come to me saying they lost their kid. We had five different kids go missing from their parents in that moment. And it was kind of funny and kind of sad and terrifying. So I'm making announcements on the microphone of like, hey, if this one belongs to you that's over here and if that one belongs to you because their parents just kind of let the kids run on the field and so I say all that to say like there's something within us like from a young age where it's like we have to win right like I'm convinced eight plastic eggs with one piece of candy in them each is not drive enough to make those kids go on the field like that it's that they wanted to beat the other kid to those eight plastic eggs with one piece of candy in it, right? And so they all flood the field. They scrounge for the eggs that are theirs. They put them in their basket, and the event is amazing. We could just go and give out candy, but nobody would show up for that. We have to drop eggs from the sky because it builds this anticipation of I'm going to be the first one there. And so there's something, I think, within all of us that's like we love to compete, don't we? Like we love to beat out someone else. Like you don't have to look very far 
our, our entire culture is built, especially in America, around the idea of competition. That's what capitalism is all about. But you look at our sports industry. Do you know the, in North America alone, the pro sports industry is a $73.5 billion industry annually now. $73.5 billion. I know half of that is going to Jerry Jones, but there's a lot that's not that they're still fighting over. That's a lot of money. And by the way, that's just like ticket sales at the gate, uh, merchandising, and naming rights. That doesn't even include like the illegal gambling that's happening on the side or all the restaurants that are profiting from people, fans coming before the game and eating at their restaurant or the travel industry that carries these players and these teams and their fans all over the nation. That also doesn't include worldwide sports. I think soccer probably makes quadruple that overseas, right? There's only North American sports, $73.5 billion. And it's not just the athletes making all kinds of money. Well, they also get endorsements, which isn't included in that stat. It's not just the athletes making all this money. Our youth sports industry is a $17 billion industry here in the United States alone. $17 billion. I signed Dalton up for tackle football last fall, and literally, there was a targeted uh, clickbait ad on the registration site that said, uh, free 50% uh, off at Dick's Sporting Goods Highland Village with the purchase of registration today. And I was like, how does this know? It's like following me. It's terrifying. They know everything. But it's an industry where even youth sports, they're wanting to capitalize and make money off of $17 billion. And those kids aren't getting paid. That's all going to organizations that aren't making a profit. They're just keeping lights on and trying to organize referees. $17 billion. There's more than 60 million athletes across the U.S. in a youth sports program of some kind. And if you're thinking, like, I'm not a big sports person, and I'm, maybe you think I'm competitive, but I'm really not, you just pull up to a stoplight and tell me you don't pick the shortest line, right? Like, you always are trying to find the quickest line to get off the light as fast as possible. It's because we're competitive and we have to win. Like, waiting five seconds longer is not going to change your day at all. It's just we have to win. Or at the grocery store, we always pick the shortest line at checkout. There's something within us. And these kids, these three to five-year-olds, they displayed it yesterday as they ran onto the field thinking, I've got to beat everyone else, even if I have to risk my life to get a plastic egg. It was a great case study of competition. And so today, I want us to kind of set up Resurrection Sunday in this lens of competition. Resurrection Sunday is like the greatest story of competition and victory we'll ever see. And so I want to look through the lens of competition as we talk about Jesus' resurrection. And we'll see a little friendly competition along the way as well. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in John chapter 20. John chapter 20. If you don't have a Bible, we've got some in the baskets on the aisles. Just elbow your neighbor, get to know him, and say, hey, pass one down. We'll also have it on the screen behind me. Those Bibles are yours to keep if you need one. Um, John chapter 20. Now, as you're turning there, I believe the resurrection story and really the whole narrative of the gospel is the greatest story ever told because, in part, it speaks to something wired within us. Even this competition piece, the gospel is the greatest story ever told because it satisfies the competitive drive within all of our hearts. John chapter 20, we're going to start in verse 1, where it says this, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So real quick, it is so cool to me that Mary Magdalene was both the first person to see the empty tomb, and we'll later we'll see she's the first person to see Jesus in his resurrected body. Um, if you're not a Jesus follower yet, and you're just kind of checking out church or doing this because a relative made you... Um, to me, this is one of the most profound proofs that Jesus wasn't just some good teacher, but that he literally rose from the grave. If you're making this story up, you would never choose a woman to arrive first. In the first century, her testimony just was not valid. And so we're going to see her run back to the disciples and get those guys to come to the tomb and confirm what she saw. But you would not write the story in such a way that a woman arrives first or that a woman receives the, the vision or be, is able to see Jesus in his resurrected body first. It's an amazing proof of Jesus's story. It continues. So she runs back in verse two and went to get Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Another side note, I won't do this the entire time, I promise. Um, John is writing this gospel, this account of Jesus's life and ministry. John was one of the 12. Uh, John also, in a humble brag, doesn't name himself in the letter, but calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loves. It's really obnoxious. So just get used to it. So that's John saying it was Peter and me. Um, and he said to them, or Mary said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. You see what he's doing here? It's really sly. We men are great at this, aren't we? So he outran Peter and reached the tomb first and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. 
Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. That's so Peter. He's like a little strong headed. He just charges in. He doesn't stop like John does. He goes right into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there. Verse seven, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, if you had forgotten the one who reached the tomb first, by the way, also went in and he saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their home. So I love the friendly competition here because it just, I am so competitive. I think I mentioned this in our Good Friday service, but uh, recently we, uh, our kids do Taekwondo and we went and had like a family night and they played family dodgeball. And we had like those big rubber balls. And I kid you not, my first throw, I threw it right at my oldest son. It rose and hit him in the face and busted his lip. And Nicole was like, Gavin. And I was like, hey, it's okay. He's growing up. And Dalton runs off to the bathroom and cleans up. And it's like, I'm sorry. I promise I didn't mean to throw it that high. It just kind of rose on me. But of course I threw it my hardest because it's dodgeball. And I don't want him to brag later. And that's what he does. So there's like something within my heart that's like super competitive. And I think, really, even if you're not as crazy out there as I am on the competition side, there's something within all of our hearts. And so seeing John and Peter kind of have this little, little race to the tomb is so fascinating. First of all, like, we know Peter is much older than John, so it's really funny that John even mentions it. Peter was the only disciple that we know of that had a family. Also, we know John lived into the second century, which was much after Jesus' resurrection, around 33 AD. Uh, and so into the second century, that would mean John was the youngest disciple at the time of following Jesus because he lived the longest. The others were martyred and John wasn't. A little side note, but still, he was likely the youngest disciple and Peter was likely the oldest. Um, Brandon, our associate pastor, is a big marathon runner. I don't know why. It's terrible. Um, he's, in fact, going to run the Nashville Marathon, I think, next week. He trains for this stuff. He loves it. He loves running. And he tries to get me to run, and I hate running. Like, I'm the guy who I'll run once or twice a week, but so I can eat as much ice cream as I want before I go to bed, right? That's the only reason you should run. And so I'll run, like, a couple miles when I run. And Brandon and I were uh, down in San Antonio a few weeks ago visiting with some other churches in our church plant network for a meeting. And he had told me, hey, I'm on this program that I need to run to get ready for this next marathon. And I've modified it so that I only have to run four miles while we're at this hotel today. You want to go run four miles with me? And I was like, that sounds awful. Why would I do that? But he made it sound like it's only four miles because he's going to go run 26.2 or whatever next week, right? And so it's only four miles. Gavin, you can do this. And I thought, I've never run that far in my life. I have done a 5K once, and it was only once, and I've never done it again, and that was like 10 years ago. Um, but I, I think I can do it. I've run a couple miles before. So we set out, and it takes like three hours. It probably wasn't that long. It felt like an eternity. And we had to go over an overpass on the sidewalk because of where the hotel was. And at first, he's like, we're going to go at an easy pace. And I was like, great. I'll just stay right next to you, and you go at an easy pace. Thanks for considering me. And we get all the way down at the two-mile mark and turn around and start coming back. And I'm like, I thought we were going at an easy pace, bro. And he said, I haven't changed my pace. I do this every day. And I was like, oh, so it's me. I'm dying. And I, like, by the time we got back to the overpass, I was like 10 steps behind him. And I could barely keep up. And I, I would never admit it in the moment. But I was cramping and I couldn't breathe. And I didn't want to keep going. And when we got to the stoplight for the overpass, I was like, thank God, there's a red light. We can stop for a minute. I can breathe. And as soon as we get there, it turns green. I was like, you got to be kidding me. So... He beats me, of course, back to the hotel, and he's smiling and doing great, and I, I was never sore than I was that next day. Um, but it's so funny because to me, like, John and Peter, they have this same kind of friendly competition, and John gets there first, and he even talks about how he's like, you know, it, if you forget, the guy who, you know, got the Jesus loves is the one who got to the tomb first. It's so like what Brandon and I were wrestling through that day. He's so much younger than me, right? He's, it's probably a few years, but still, I feel like I'm as old as the number of kids I've had, right? And so each kid adds like a decade to my life, and I've got the shots to prove it. And um, I woke up like on Thursday this week for no reason. I just had a pulled muscle in my neck and couldn't move my neck. It's like you get old and it just starts falling apart. So I'm going to blame it on that, even though Brandon is just faster than I am and he trains and works out regularly. I'm a little jealous, but there's something, I think, again, within us, even Peter and John, and we see the disciples wrestle with this throughout the ministry. Some like arguing and saying, Jesus, let us sit at your right hand in your coming kingdom. And the others are indignant and mad. And how, how dare you try to get this seat of honor or prestige? The disciples often are even at odds with each other, trying to jockey for position so much like we do in our pride today and silly little things like running with a friend. Peter and John, they run to the tomb. Now, something is super fascinating to me. As they get there, John just kind of stoops down and looks inside the tomb, but he doesn't enter. 
And then Peter gets there and he goes straight in. And then we, we read, uh, I don't remember what verse it was there, towards the end, verse 8, the other disciple, the one who had reached the tomb first, in case you forgot, also went in and he saw and believed. He saw and believed. So John stoops down and stays outside the tomb for a moment. You can imagine the emotion that's overwhelming him. He already saw the guy he put all of his trust in go to the cross and die. The disciples didn't fully understand that Jesus would have to die. They thought he would become this conquering king and overthrow the Roman Empire. And so they saw him die. Now they've gone to the tomb after the Sabbath day, and they assume they'll go and embalm his body, and instead they find the tomb empty. Now, in that day, there was a lot of people in the first century who would actually rob graves because a lot of people would be buried with valuables, and they don't need it anymore. And so people would just go and crack open the tomb and take valuables with them and steal from the tomb. And so maybe Peter and John thought that was what was happening. Uh, it's also very likely that they assumed the religious leaders were so angry at Jesus and the movement that he started that it wasn't enough for them just to hang him on a cross, but rather they wanted to embarrass him more by taking his body away and not giving him a proper burial. And so whatever Peter and John were thinking that day, they were not thinking he's resurrected because they get there, they look, they're overwhelmed with emotion and grief. And later after John steps into the grave, it's that moment that he believes. It's that moment that he believes in the resurrection that Jesus would rise from the dead. I, I wonder how often we do this in our own lives, like John. Like we get to the edge of the tomb and we stoop down and we look in the tomb, but we're unwilling to step into the tomb. But if we would just step in, we would understand that God is working a miracle. Like how often do we allow our own comfort and our control keep us from stepping into what we think might be like dying? But if we would just take a faith step, we would see God's miraculous provision. How often do we stand outside the tomb unaware of what God would do if we would just embrace the suffering or the difficulty and we could just take a step of faith with him and see the miracle that comes within the tomb? I believe so often God actually calls us to allow a dream die in order that he might resurrect it in his time. I think sometimes we have to step into the tomb to realize the miracle. John stood outside the tomb in disbelief, and when he steps in, embraces the death, embraces the fact that he's in a surrounding marred by the death of the one he once trusted in. It's there in that setting that he understands and he believes. Sometimes we have to step into the tomb to see a miracle. Let's continue on in verse 11, and let's see how Jesus appeared in his resurrected body after the crucifixion. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. So the other disciples had run back and Mary stayed behind because she wasn't as competitive, I guess. And she stood at the tomb and continued to weep. As she wept, she, stood, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing but she did not know that it was Jesus. So real quick, I wouldn't read too much into the fact that she didn't recognize Jesus in that moment. Um, she is overcome with mourning and sadness. She's weeping. She can't see through her own tears enough to recognize she was just talking to two angels. Like anywhere you see angels appear in scripture, they say one thing at the very beginning every time almost. Don't be afraid. Fear not. An angel appearing on the scene is an overwhelming manifestation of the glory of God. And so the fact that she just starts talking to these angels in response, like it's no big deal, means she doesn't really recognize what's going on. These two angels sitting in the tomb. She looks to Jesus and doesn't recognize him because in her sorrow and grief, she can't even comprehend it. And she's just overwhelmed with tears and can't see through her own tears. So she doesn't recognize that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Think of Mary saying to this guy, I'll do whatever it takes. I probably can't carry a grown male corpse out of this tomb, but I'll take it and I'll carry it. I'll figure out a way to do it. I don't have the means to go buy a tomb elsewhere, but if you just know where he is, I'll figure it out. I'll make a way. I'm going to take care of Jesus. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Then Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. It's overwhelming to me that Mary in all of her emotion doesn't recognize Jesus. 
And yet, it's in that moment that Jesus calls her by name and something shifts. Such a miraculous moment where Jesus just says her name and she recognizes the Lord. I love how verse 15 gives us this subtle thing, this clue that really ties this passage into what I would call the greatest story ever told. Verse 15, Mary, before she responds, we get this little cue that she was supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him. Supposing him to be the gardener. I like to think that the Holy Spirit allowed for John, the gospel writer, after hearing the story from Mary Magdalene, recorded that tiny, minute detail that Mary thought that he was the gardener. Because the grand narrative of what God has been doing in human history has been bookended by a garden experience. From the very beginning of time, the story would start in such a way that God planted a garden called Eden in the east. And there he created man and woman in his image and he told them, be fruitful and multiply. And there's all of this stuff that I've given you. You can have any of it. You can eat any of it. Enjoy and have dominion and continue in the process of creation. But do one thing for me. Don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what did they do? Like all of us have done, right? They went their own way. They ate the fruit. They thought it would give them power like God, knowledge like God, and sin entered the world. And you and I, since that time, have been born into a world and by our own choosing where we have fallen into sin because it came into the world. We've all sinned and fallen short, as Romans 3, 23 would tell us. We've fallen short of the mark, which is perfection. This whole thing started in a garden. It was there in the garden where God made Adam and Eve. If you skip ahead to Jesus' own ministry, there's all kinds of garden moments, but the most impactful one is the moment on the night that he is betrayed when he's about to go to be crucified. He's in this garden called Gethsemane, and it's there in that garden, him sitting before the Lord in prayer. He sweats drops of blood because he's in so much turmoil and anguish, and he says, God, if there's any other way, just let this cup of suffering pass from me, but not my will, yours be done. And he cries out again, God, if there's another plan, I know it's been the plan since the beginning. I was there at the beginning of the foundation. All things were created through me, as Colossians says. And yet, if there's another way to do it, I don't want to bear the cup of suffering. And in that moment of humanity, while being fully God, Jesus shows us what's lying ahead. It's not just physical pain on the cross. It is bearing the sins of all people who would ever live. So I talked about competition earlier, and I know I mentioned this on Friday night, but to me, there is something beautiful about God's wrath and his justice. And hear me out, because we shrink away from those words in our world today, because they're scary, and we assume God's angry if he wants justice or if he's wrathful. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see the wrath of God. We see God saying, I will crush sin. I will win over sin. And frankly, I can't get on board with a God who's not powerful enough to beat out cancer and injustice and pain and suffering and all of the consequences of sin that we see in our fallen world. If we serve a God who can't crush those things, that can't win out, he has no power to lead us in life either. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus is crying out, I don't want to absorb it, and yet I know it's the will of the Father. I know it has been the plan since the beginning, and I will step in and say, yes, I will do it. I will take on the sins that each and every person who's ever lived have ever committed. And in taking their place, I will take the wrath that you deserve. It's in Gethsemane that Jesus acknowledges in that garden, I will be your substitute. I live the perfect life. I will be the sacrifice, and God will crush sin, and he'll give it the just payment it deserves, but it won't be you. It'll be my life that's taken in your place. So he bears the sins of the world on the cross, and God is ruling over. He is victorious over. He wins the day over sin, but instead of choosing to crush you and I, who we absolutely deserve, he instead chooses to crush his own sin. It was in the Garden of Eden that the whole story began and sin entered the world. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus acknowledges and accepts the cup of suffering that's coming to him, and it's here in the Garden at this tomb that Joseph of Arimathea gave to the Lord. It's here in this garden that Jesus resurrects and reveals himself for the very first time to a woman named Mary. And he calls her by name and acknowledges, I have now absorbed the penalty. I have risen again and conquered the grave and I have given you something to celebrate. And she mistakes him as the gardener. Think of what a gardener does. A gardener is one who works soil, plants a seed and waits for the harvest. 
Mary mistakes Jesus as the gardener, one who is going to plant the seed and is going to bring in a harvest as Jesus allows God to crush sin on our behalf. There will be many that find their way back to God as a result of the seed that was planted in Jesus and the harvest that is coming. So Mary, overcome with emotion, mistakes Jesus as a gardener. And this to me, it announces in Jesus' death, God wins over sin. In Jesus' death, a seed's planted that bursts forth to new life in Christ. In Jesus' death, a harvest will be collected of children finding their way back to their father. It is such a beautiful picture of what life in Christ looks like. And so Jesus says these remarkable words in verse 17 in John chapter 20 that we just read. He says, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the father. Don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. So here's what Jesus did. He actually appeared to a bunch of people for about 40 days and did more miracles and spoke and taught more. And then 40 days later, he ascended into heaven and is seated in his physical body with the nail holes and the spear hole and all in heaven next to the Father. And in those 40 days, I love that it was 40 days because he ascended on this festival in the Jewish culture called First Fruits, which is when you would take the first of your crop that you produce and give it back to God as a sign of the harvest that's yet to come and how he's abundantly blessed you. So Jesus ascends into heaven saying, I am the first fruit of much more harvest yet to come. And he is going to ascend to the Father. And I want to read what that looks like real quick in Romans chapter 8 before we wrap up. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 31, we read this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Whom shall bring any charge against God's elect? That's those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ. It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I love this picture of Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf. If we had time, the book of Hebrews talks about how Jesus now serves not just as this one who prays for us. I think that's what we think of interceding or intercession. That's a fancy word for pray for someone else, right? Um, Jesus isn't just seated at the right hand of God, praying on our behalf. He has now served as our high priest, as Israel had a high priest. And he paid the sacrifice for our sin once for all time. And now, instead of continuing to stand back up and make more sacrifices, he's seated at the right hand of God because the work is finished. And in the position of sitting at the right hand of God the Father, he now gets to intercede for us and say, I have brought in a harvest, calling God's children home. It, it is this beautiful thing where God is ministering on our behalf, where the God of the universe who wins over sin doesn't look at the sin within us, but he instead sees us through the lens of Jesus Christ who says, that's one of your children who's accepted me as Lord and Savior. Look at my righteousness and the price I paid. They've already been saved. They're redeemed. I am interceding on their behalf. And he now intercedes, ministers for us. And more than that, there's now no thing in life, no struggle, no sin, no suffering, no difficulty we can walk through, no Easter egg that we're chasing after that we think will satisfy us, that can separate us from the love of God. Because like little three to five-year-olds, we have all run onto a field we don't belong onto. We've all chased after things that we think will satisfy our soul. And we have this loving Father God who wants to call us back home. And Jesus has done it on our behalf. After the helicopter left and the kids ran onto the field and the mayhem was over, I had this really cool moment, this weird opportunity, where all these little kiddos were walking over to me and, and parents were coming over to me saying they lost their children. And I was like this guy with a dumb microphone who announced, hey, if you lost your kid, we're going to have them over here, right? And it was kind of this, what do we do, scramble moment. And there was one little girl in particular, if she was three, I, I think she was like a young two and the parents were like, yeah, just give her the blue wristband, right? But anyway, she was out there with the three to five-year-olds 
And someone, she couldn't, she wasn't like talking. She was so scared. She had lost her parents in the midst of the egg hunt. And someone just kind of led her over to where I was holding the microphone. And I bent down and the lady that was helping said, hey, she's lost. She can't find her dad. And I said, sweetie, what's your name? And I'll, I'll announce it so your dad can come. And she just froze, tears streaming down her eyes. She couldn't say a thing. And, and so I just was like, I don't know what to do. Uh, okay. Uh, so I grabbed my little microphone. I said, hey, if you're the owner of a uh, adorable little girl in a bright pink Eskimo Joe t-shirt, we found her, she's over here, she's good, but you might wanna come and find her. And I kid you not, seconds later, a man comes running from across the barn. He runs across the field. And this girl, just like she turns around and runs to her dad and he scoops her up and she's like, she's finally home and she's safe and she knows everything's gonna be okay. And I got to use a dumb microphone to intercede for the father and the lost child. And now in this moment, as we close service today, I get to use another dumb microphone and I get to sit in a position that says, Jesus has done this work of intercession for you. He paid the penalty you couldn't afford. He went to the cross to bear your sin so that God couldn't just win over sin, but so he could win his lost child back. The father wants so desperately to have his children home. And Jesus went to the cross to bear your iniquity and rose in new life to bring forth the opportunity for us to be in right relationship with our Father. That's what Easter is all about. And that's why this is the greatest story ever told. Because the tomb is empty and we have new life in Christ. I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads, close their eyes. Before we rush out of here and before we close in prayer, I don't want to make this like an emotional thing, which I do because I get teary-eyed. But if you're here and you've, you've never put your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're realizing today in this moment, the Father loves you and he is calling you home. And my hope and prayer is that the Holy Spirit is just messing with you right now and just calling you, beckoning you, stirring within your very soul that the Father wants you back. And that yeah, he's won, he's victorious, but he didn't crush you, he crushed Jesus on your behalf. And now you can have new life in Christ. I just want to give you the opportunity to put your trust in him today. And look, there's no like magical formula, but I'm just going to ask if you want to pray a prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, just look up at me real quick. And looking up is just a way that you can profess faith. As scripture says, you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead and you will be saved. So you can, without people looking around, you can just look up at me and say, I profess faith today. Those of you looking at me, let's just pray this prayer. You can pray it in your own heart, however you feel led, but say something like this. Jesus, I know that I've sinned, but I know that you're a savior. And I acknowledge that you came into the world to pay the penalty I couldn't afford, that you went to the cross bearing my sins and were killed so that God could have the power to overcome sin. And yet Jesus you also raised to new life, inviting me into a right relationship with a loving God who's not distant and not angry, but poured out justice on you instead of me. So Jesus, I choose to make you my Lord and my Savior. I'm looking in the tomb. I'm stepping inside. I'm saying, I don't want to do it my way anymore. I don't want to chase a bunch of Easter eggs that I know are empty inside. I want to step into life with you. I believe in you, Jesus. And I choose to follow you all the days of my life. God, for my brothers and sisters who just prayed this prayer, I ask that you would just fill them with your Holy Spirit, that you would guide and lead them and counsel them as they continue to grow in what life in eternity looks like, connected to their Father. I pray that we would be a church who comes alongside people and helps others grow in their faith as we continue to see you reap a harvest in our midst. It's in your name we pray. Amen.